It's time, it's time, it's time for another episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. I'm bringing my co-host Tom on, um, but first we want you to know that this show is an offshoot of our popular blog at paperbackwarrior.com where you can read hundreds and hundreds of vintage fiction reviews. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and all of the popular podcasting platforms where you can find an archive of 100 episodes of this very show. Uh, Feel free to donate tips by clicking on the top right-hand corner of the desktop version of the blog. And if you're following us on YouTube, uh, there should be some video there of the books uh, that we're looking at and reviewing some images and things like that. That's fairly new for us um, as of last episode. So, Tom, tell fans and listeners what's happening today. Thank you, Eric. Today we are looking at an unsung 20th century author by the name of Steve Frazee. He authored dozens and dozens of full-length Western novels and crime fiction, and many stories for the pulps and digests like Manhunt and Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. He also served as president and vice president of the Western Writers of America. Eric, you're also going to be reviewing a 2013 horror novel called Cradle Lake by one of our favorite scary writers, Ronald Malfi. But before we get into the show, I want to tell you about this bizarre book haul that I had in kind of the implementation of a strategy I talked about many, many uh, months ago. Do you um, you good for that? Can I yes. Start? Okay. Go so, for it. So the Jacksonville Public Library. Uh, Eric and I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville Public Library has a quarterly book sale. It's gigantic, and it's one of those bag sales where they give you a paper bag when you walk in, and you can fill that paper bag up full of books. And so the bags this time, uh, when you filled it up on the particular night I went, the price changes over the course of the weekend was six dollars per bag. And so there were no books there that I actually wanted or very few. And so, but I filled six bags full of good condition old paperbacks. Again, not stuff that I would actually read, a lot of historical romance and kind of bestsellers from yesteryear, which cost me, do the math with me, $36, right? Got it. Okay, good. And so what I did was I took those books, I kind of collated them. Oh, it it should be said that among those books, among those six, the one thing that was very interesting is they had a complete set, I don't know if it's a complete set, but books one through 99 with a couple missing of perfect condition Perry Rodan uh, paperbacks from the science fiction series. I love it. Just beautiful condition. So I set those aside. That's not the kind of books that I read or would really enjoy. They're translated from another language. Uh, People say they're they're not that great, but other people are just crazy about them. They're very popular with collectors. So I set those that 99 or so books aside, and I started collating the books into kind of their different genres. And um, and I have this old suitcase that you can see over your right hand shoulder, Eric, if you turn around, that I filled that with books and I brought it to our local used bookstore here and asked for credit. And this bookstore gives full credit for books. And it's the best bookstore in North America. I can plug it. It's called Chamblin's Bookstore. And so I brought it there. And the, so my first haul of su- in the suitcase, I got $75 worth of credit in uh, for the bookstore. That's incredible. Yeah, and they're now charging $4 per used paperback of the stuff that we like and read. And so then I went back two more times. The second visit, I got $125 credit. The third visit, I got another $75. So now we're up to... $275 worth of credit of books. And they give dollar for dollar. Like I can spend that yeah. at, for $275 worth of books. I don't have to actually dig into my wallet at all. Some book, used bookstores make you pay 50 cents on a dollar and you can eat your credit up. Not this place. They give you full credit for the used books you sell them. And then I went on eBay and I sold the Perry Rodan books for 60 bucks. So for $36 of, uh, of my effort, it just took about an hour, just literally filling a paper bag full of books that I knew the local used bookstore here would buy back from me, I ended up with like $310 worth, of, well, $60 cash, which will you know, eventually, you know, money's fungible, but it will be spent on books one way or another. And then enough money for me to buy as many used books as I want for as long as I want. <laughs> That's pure genius. It's a good business. And so let me just tell you three of the books I picked up. One is called The Scorpion Single, uh, Scorpion Signal by Adam Hall. It's one of the Quiller books. Uh, this particular one is from 1980. Uh, the subject matter looked good. It's a, you know KGB, you know, going to provoke the World War III. Quiller can find his old friend who can stop him, blah, 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 blah. The Quiller books are very highly regarded. A lot of people I know say it's the best spy series. 
I have yet to find the one that I truly fall in love with that makes me hooked into it. But Adam Hall, they're British. Uh, it's a very good writer. They're first person, which I like. So they have kind of a Matt Helm-like tone to them. He's sort of a, a rebel and kind of constantly rolling his eyes at the administration he needs to deal with in his spy work. The real author is a gentleman by the name of Elliston Trevor. And so I'm going to read that. The Scorpion Signal is one of the books I got on credit. The next book is by a guy named Ron Faust. You ever heard of him? I have not. Okay, so this one's called In the Forest of the Night. Ron Faust was a fairly popular author. This particular book was from 1993, which is hard to believe. It was like 30 years ago. And um, this one here is uh, trapped in a jail cell in a troubled Central America republic. Martin Springer, he's a volunteer doctor. He faces execution. His wife is um, comes to save him, but she gets arrested also. So he's got to break out of this dungeon jail, rescue his wife, and kill his tormentors. I posted a picture of this on the Men's Adventure book uh, Facebook group that we're a member of, and everybody went bananas saying this is a fantastic book. The other good news is that it's also available as an audiobook. So I may actually download this before my next uh, trip uh, overseas and read it that way while also having the paperback handy. Do you know if the audio version's on Hoopla? That's a good question. I did not okay. look because, yeah, Hoopla is the free version, which I, I should be using more of that instead of spending my credits on Audible. I was going to say, are you part of Audible? Yeah, I okay. uh, I buy I buy like ten packs uh, several a year. Yeah, I just uh, I've been so bad about reading lately, and my productivity as far as producing reviews for you has been so small because of the uh, this business that I'm now running. Uh, but that audiobooks tend to actually fill that gap for me a bit. The last book I want to hype is a little interesting one. It's called Oakhurst. It's the first in a five book series. Of, it, it's kind of a plantation adventure, but this one's a little more seafaring. The, uh, the author is credited as Walter Reed Johnson, but it's one of those book creations books kind of you know, produced by Lyle Kenyon Ingle, and he did a very good job most of the time of hiding who the real author was. And so I did some research with my friend James Reasoner, and James Reasoner's theory is that the book is actually by a fellow named Paul Little. L-I-T-T-L-E, who also wrote the Windhaven series under a pseudonym for book creations. Paul Little is an interesting character. I, I did a little bit of homework on him. Give me a second here. So this guy, Paul Hugo Little, he lived between 1915 and 1987. He was an American author of what we would call pulp fiction today, and he wrote a lot of historical novels, probably these, this Oakhurst series, definitely the Windhaven series. He also wrote a series called The Hawk and the Dove, under the pen name, uh, pen names including Marie de Jorel, Lee Franklin James. He was one of the guys who was in Lyle Kenyon Ingalls' stable. He authored 700 books in his life. Historical novels, erotica, romance novels. Most of his books were all published under pseudonyms. He did publish a few books under his own names, including a book on chess theory and a literary novel called The Condominium Trap. There was a writer for the Chicago Tribune that said that the Guinness Book of World Records listed a South African woman named Kathleen Lindsay as the most prolific writer with 904 novels. But Mr. Little believed he was second, averaging a novel every week um, and a half since 1963 until his death in 1987 at the age of 72. I think we've probably talked about and reviewed authors who've written over a thousand books, but, but Little seems to be a pretty uh, prolific guy. Uh, Lyle Kenyon Ingle, for all of his faults as a person and a businessman, produced some pretty good books. So this Oakhurst novel, this fiery epic saga of bold men and women carving out an empire in the passionate, richly romantic time of America's past, looks like it might be something I would read and enjoy. I think so. So anyway, that's my book haul. You picked up some new westerns. Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, new to me, but not necessarily new. I was at uh, Second and Charles here in Jacksonville. It's a chain. Yuck, I hate that place. <laughs> they, they normally don't have... They the, have a good Western section, though. I think I see where you're going with They this. do. Um, they have a good Western section. So um, they're a chain specialized in books, records, shirts, toys, video games. Basically just a, a nerd adventure place. Uh, but this isn't a commercial for the store, but it's like um, you know, mostly the location isn't very fruitful. But if I go sporadically, it seems like they stock up with the type of books that I do like to read. And I'm probably the only person buying them. So I bought a stack of used Western paperbacks, uh, but wanted to bring up the two that seemed the most interesting uh, first is a paperback called Trouble Man. It's written by Ed Gorman, has a great cover, was published by Leisure in 1998. Uh, the premise is interesting. Uh, it says here that a famed gunfighter named Ray packs it in, goes honest, and joins a traveling Wild West show giving sharpshooting exhibitions. But he receives word that his son was killed in a gunfight in a city called Coopersville. So Ray goes to Coopersville to just retrieve his son's body. However, his past reputation as an outlaw leads the city to think he's stepping off the train to bring them hell. 
It looks great. Uh, it's a little longer than I like at 300 pages, but uh, it's got a large font. And I, I like Ed Gorman stuff, so I'm kind of interested to read this. Uh, the second Western paperback I bought is called Reaching Colorado by Frank Roderus. It was published by Ballantine in 1984. This paperback version I bought is from 1986. Now, Roderus, like Ed Gorman, is a Spur Award winner as well. He won uh, Spur Awards in 1983 and 1996. The premise for Reaching Colorado sounds really cool to me, Tom. A young guy named Harrison leaves Kansas, hits the trail to grow up and be a man. In an effort to be a hero, Harrison sees some bank robbers escaping with money. Harrison hijacks the bank robbers, steals the money from them with the intention of turning it over to the law. The problem is, is that the bank robbers are the law. So the tables quickly turn as these crooked lawmen are now after Harrison as the robber. It's my type of novel at 150 pages, and uh, I think I'm really going to read this one like soon. Tom, if, uh, what, what else we got? Well, I haven't bought anything uh, of interest recently except for those books I talked about, but I did get this in the mail. It's called. It's a double from Starkhouse called The Mexico Run and Jailbreak, both by Lionel White. It has an introduction by a young upstart named Eric Compton. Stop it. You're making me blush. I know. So uh, I, you've reviewed both of these books, and you wrote the introduction to it, and I finally have a copy, which I will treasure forever. Have you gotten your copy, your uh, review copy of it yet? I think I have just the uh, the, the uh, digital version. I think. So hold, I just handed it to you. You're holding this introduction for the Stark House book that you wrote. You've never seen it before. I have never seen this before, actually. It's great. Take, take yeah. a look at the end of the uh, introduction and make sure they got the bio right when they talk about you as a person. That's the most interesting part. What's it say? Read your bio. Oh, my. Oh, geez. Um, it says here. Uh, Did you go on for 10 pages? <laughs> Mine was only one paragraph. <laughs> I got, uh, you may read this. Yeah, read it. All right. It says, uh, Eric Compton created the Paperback Warrior brand in 2013, a blog focusing on vintage paperbacks of the 20th century and genre fiction like crime noir, science fiction, spy, espionage, military, pulp, fantasy, western, and gothic romance. Uh, beginning in 2018, Eric partnered with real-life private detective and retired FBI special agent Tom Simon to include additional reviews, interviews, original columns, and more commentary on paperback novels and pulps. The Paperback Warrior podcast, hosted by Eric and Tom, launched in 2019 with over 100 episodes. It's become the Internet's most popular vintage fiction podcast. Yeah, that's great, man. And congratulations on getting on uh, actually having that published in paper. Someone sent me a photo the other day of a copy of the Stark House Harry Whittington double that I wrote the introduction for, a, a copy they had taken out of a library in Denver, Colorado. Oh, really? Yeah, so Stark House actually, you know, I don't know how many copies they sell. It's not like we get a piece of the action. But they have a decent distribution in America's library system. So so young children all over the world <laughs> will be taking out your book for free at the library that, after they get like done reading The Giving Tree and other library books they get. That gives me the gooseies. Yeah, this is a big deal. So... Uh, Anyway, uh, that, uh, that's the biggest book I've received lately. Um, and without that out of the way, let's go to the feature. Hit the music. As Tom had alluded to earlier, today's feature is on an author named Steve Frazee. We're not sure if it's Frazee or Frazee. Uh, he's a writer that most Western fans really admire and like. But unfortunately, his literary work mostly goes unnoticed. And uh, I think that's a real shame. So let's get into it. Starting from the beginning, uh, Charles Stephen Frazee was born in Colorado on September 28, 1909. Frazee worked in mining as a teen and continued working heavy construction through 1936. In 1937, Frazee graduated from Western State College with a degree in journalism. He married Patricia Thomas and they had two kids. Frazee taught high school journalism for four years, then returned to heavy construction as a superintendent in 1941. In 1943, he joined the U.S. Navy and served during World War II. From, the 1950, or from 1950 through 1968, he was a building inspector for the city of Salida, Colorado. Tom, you ever been there? I have not. I have not spent a ton of time in Colorado. You're I'm, like not a, a, I'm not a skier. You're like a Johnny Cash song, though. You've been everywhere, man. I have been everywhere, but I try to avoid cold weather places, and Colorado just has way too many of those. <laughs> right. uh, so, Tom, you and the listeners are probably wondering where uh, writing is actually coming in at, right? So, Frazee sold his first story to the pulp magazine Short Stories in December 1936. The story was called Planked Minor, uh, Minor, M-I-N-E-R. But his second published story didn't happen until 11 years later. Uh, the story was called Shotguns at Shavno. 
It was published in Adventure Magazine's July 1947 issue. Uh, it had to be incredibly frustrating to have such a long hiatus between published uh, work, but Frazee made up for it. From 1947 forward, Frazee was spending all of his free time writing stories and novels while also working for the city. Uh, Tom, Frazee signed with the Scott Meredith Agency, uh, a prestigious literary agency. Um, what can you tell listeners about Scott Meredith? Scott Meredith was probably the most prestigious literary agency of the 1950s for people who like the kind of books we talk about here on Paperback Warrior. Um, Lawrence Block was actually a, a, a copy editor for them and I think was eventually represented by them. Scott Meredith had a really good line in with Fawcett Gold Medal um, and got a lot of his authors placed there. He also had a really, really good line uh, inside uh, Manhunt Magazine. So a guy like Steve Frazee or Gil Brewer, or any of the other dudes who were on board with Scott Meredith were able to get their stories placed in Manhunt Magazine, which was in Scott, Scott, Scott Meredith's clients were like the farm team for Manhunt. And every, if you listen to the show, you know how, what high regard I hold Manhunt Magazine. It was the best magazine out there in the history of crime fiction as far as publishing really good blood on the knuckles, hard boiled crime fiction. So because of that, uh, Frazee's stories really took off. So from 1947 through the 1950s, Frazee had over 50 short stories published in magazines like 15 Western Tales, Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, Argosy, uh, Dime Western, Max Brand's Western Magazine, Gunsmoke, Detective Story, Saint Detective, and Adventure. Most of these were all Westerns or a form of high adventure, mostly set in Colorado, but Frazee also authored science fiction and crime fiction stories, too. It wasn't just all Westerns. Uh, for example, his stories, When Earth Gods Kill, is about modern mining. Uh, Dragon Fires is a fantasy story. Flying Saucers Do Exist, as you can imagine, is sci-fi. Marine in the Tops is military fiction. Graveyard Shift is crime fiction. His first full-length novel was called Range Trouble. It was published by Phoenix Press in 1951 under a pseudonym of Dean Jennings. It's a fairly rare book. It's a hardcover. I've seen one listed on eight books. It was like 25 bucks. It's kind of a beat-up library copy. Uh, his second novel, Shining Mountains, published the same year as a hardcover under Frazee's own name. This book has been reprinted a number of times. Uh, the book is about two ex-soldiers, one from the Union, one from the Confederacy, that find themselves in an unusual alliance searching for gold in Colorado. Frazee described the book as... No great historical figures stride through the Shining Mountains. Just eh, men and women that I knew 25 years ago in Summit County. Their words were the words of men and women, not the dull, dubious words you find in written history. So after Shining Mountains, uh, Frazee had two books published in 1952. Uh, both were published by Lion Books, and they were Pistol Man and Utah Hell Guns. In 1953, he also had two more westerns published by Lyon, Lawman's Feud and Sharp the Bugle Calls. But also in 1953, Frazee authored an unusual novel called The Sky Block. It's not a western. In fact, I can't even remember what the book's about. But, uh, Tom, you've got a copy of that book. I think you do. Or, or I think you even brought it up on the show at one point. All right. The Sky Block by Steve Frazee. What a great cover this has. It is. All right. So the back says, The Secret Weapon of an Unseen Enemy. Vensel had known the mountain when he was a boy. He had climbed it, hunted on it, fished it at streams. But when he came back, he found the mountain a place of swiftly spilling blood and sudden death. Vensel turned into an angry, vengeful man, and he swore to flush out the terrifying menace of Blue Peak. But no man alone could fight the barbarous enemy hidden deep inside the mountain. So Vensel joined with a team of Army Brass, FBI agents, and the nation's top scientists, and all of them caught up in a desperate hunt for the most devastating weapon ever devised for the destruction of mankind. Basically, as I recall this book, there's an electronic apparatus of some kind up in the novel that shoots these electronic hot shots that can impact the weather. Uh, it ruins okay. crops all over the country and all that, and, but it has control of it. So basically a death ray on a mountain that this man has to stop with a, a ragamuffin team of FBI agents and commandos. That was also an excellent uh, G.I. Joe miniseries, The Weather Dominator. 
Cool. There's one of the Matt Helm books where that's a... Uh, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that's a thing also. Uh, hey, let me ask you this. We're talking about uh, pop culture. Do you remember Elizabeth Montgomery? Oh, boy, did I have a crush on her as a kid. She was the cutest witch on television. She would blink her eyes and crazy stuff would happen. I always wish that she would blink her eyes and just show up in my living room. Uh, but your mouth happened. to God's ears. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. Star of the old show Bewitched. Uh, her husband had an old show, too. Uh, his name was Robert Montgomery. He had an anthology show similar to, uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock Presents or what was the other one, Night Gallery. Uh, the book you just described, The Skyblock, was adapted into an episode for that show. Oh, I had no idea. That's cool. So there you go. Uh, so Frazee uh, became the president of the Western Writers of America in 1954. In 1955, along with the Western's Spur to the Smoke for Perma Books, Cry Coyote for Macmillan, Frazee also saw his Western Many Rivers to Cross, published by Fawcett Gold Medal. The book was a reworking of a short story by the same name that was published in Argosy in 1953. I owned that book and I had a chance to read and review it. Uh, the review's out on the blog. Real fast, uh, the book is set in the late 1700s. Stars a vagabond wilderness guy named Bushrod Gentry. What a great name. Uh, he's a, a white guy who was raised by the Shawnee and now lives a loner exploring North America. He finds himself in Kentucky, gets in a fight with some Native Americans at the very beginning of the book. Uh, coming to his aid is a young woman named Mary. So uh, she brings him back to her family, which uh, unfortunately is a group of Irish drunks. Mary's hoping to swoon Gentry into marrying her, but Gentry is a man of the forest. Uh, he doesn't want to be tied down to some woman. So Mary is sexually charged up, wants a man, and her family puts the pressure on Gentry to get hitched up. It's really a funny book. It's really well written. And I can remember laughing out loud at some of the, uh, the situations Gentry finds himself in. Uh, the best way to, to describe it, oddly enough, is like Ori Hit meets Zane Grey. <laughs> wow, that's something. It's an odd, but with a heavy dose of humor. It was made into a movie uh, starring Robert Taylor. Uh, Fawcett Gold Medal published a second printing of that paperback to match the, uh, the film. Uh, Cry Coyote Western from 1955 was reprinted recently by Prologue Books in multiple formats. So was his 1956 Western He Wrote Alone. It was originally published by Fawcett. He also had another 1956 Western called Tumbling Range Woman, published by Pocket Books. Uh, his novel Pistol Man was reprinted by Linford Western Library. And Spur to the Smoke was also reprinted, but I'm not sure uh, who the publisher was. Uh, Frazee's contemporary short story, My Brother Down There, won first place for Best American Short Stories of the Year in the annual story contest conducted by Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. This story appeared with the award in the April 1953 issue. The short story was eventually enhanced and adapted into the 1957 paperback, Running Target, which was published by Fawcett Gold Medal and also made into a movie of the same name, which Frazee collaborated on writing. I also own that paperback. I read and reviewed it. The book's about a sheriff and his son, uh, two deputies, a female business owner that are tracking down four escaped prisoners through the mountains. So it's like a modern Western with the trackers on horseback, but there's like planes and cars to make it you know, more modern. Tom, I hated the book. Uh, I found it to be 160 pages of just wandering around in the wilderness. It did nothing for me. But there's lots of fans out there that really like the book and uh, tend to enjoy the movie. Uh, there was a short story called Hell High, published in Adventure Magazine in 1952. Uh, Frazee added to the story and converted, in, converted it into his novel High Cage, which was published in 1957 by Macmillan. Like Running Target, this novel was also adapted into a film called High Hell, released in 1958. I read and reviewed the novel, really liked it. It's about a guy named Craig that's hired by an investor to run a mining expedition in the frozen Canadian Rockies. Craig hires four experienced miners, and they all climb the snowy slopes to set up this mining operation that's going to run through the winter. However, the group is joined by an unexpected guest, a beautiful woman. So High Cage then becomes the suspenseful time clock as these men, trapped on frozen slopes for the winter, start becoming suspicious of each other when it comes to the woman. They all want her, um, which I thought was a really clever idea. It's a Western theme despite being contemporary. It's, uh, it's really good. Again, the short story was Hell High. Novel is High Cage. Movie is High Hell. It's confusing as hell. Uh, here's a few more novels that Frazee wrote. Uh, according to author Bill Pronzini, uh, Desert, Guns is a uh, Desert Guns is a powerful character study set in the great southwest of the 1850s. 
relating one man's epic struggle against the land, his enemies, and his own greed. A Day to Die relates the story of a bloody 1869 war between the U.S. Calvary and several Native American tribes. A Rendezvous tells a tense story of the Rocky Mountain fur trade and the courage of the traders, or courage of the trappers. More Damn Tourists, that's kind of an odd title, is a modern novel set in a small Colorado town and is apparently a comedy. Uh, there's more novels, uh, just real quickly. He Wrote Alone, uh, Hell's Grin, um, more Hollywood connections with those. The movie Wild Heritage was released in 1958 based on Frazee's story. Also, Frazee had started writing more for television to con- coincide with some of his stories. There were two episodes of Cheyenne listing Frazee as a story writer. Uh, those episodes, Big Ghost Basin and The Bounty Hunters. Also, an episode of Zane Gray Theater credits Frazee on the episode There Were Four. There was The Alaskans in 1959 and an episode of 77 Sunset Strip, both listing Frazee as a writer. His novel Desert Guns became the movie Gold of the Seven Saints in 1961. There was a Western show called Bronco Hat that used several of Frazee's stories as episodes, including Beginner's Luck, Payroll of the Dead, Freeze Out, and One Evening in Abilene. Frazee also wrote some film and television novelizations and uh, tie-in books. In 1960, Frazee's The Alamo was published as a novelization of the popular John Wayne movie of the same name. But the funny thing is that the book has nothing to do with the movie. It's an original story by Frazee, but was marketed as a novelization of the John Wayne movie. It's kind of a clever, <laughs> clever for the publisher, but it's a bit of misdirection. It's, kind of false really, advertising. Like, hey, read, you like the movie? Read the book. It's a totally different book. It happens to have the same name. It's really terrible. Yeah. Um, Frazee also authored young adult or uh, or children's books in the Bonanza, Swiss Family Robinson, Zorro, and Lassie franchises. He also authored a plane crash disaster novel called Flight 409 which was published by Avon in 1969. I had the intention of reviewing that book for this episode, but I got about 30 pages into it, and I just couldn't follow the action. Uh, he introduced so many characters that I had a notebook and pen and ran out of paper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it drives me crazy. So I just gave up. Uh, Frazee won the Western Heritage Award and was honored by the Cowboy Hall of Fame in 1961. In the 1970s, Frazee was published by the likes of Lancer and Ballantine, a step down from his typical publishing power. Those books included A Gun for Bragg's Woman and Fire in the Valley. His 1972 novel, The Way Through the Mountains, is considered a major historical novel. Uh, according to Bill Pronzini, uh, Frazee's writing style consisted of five ingredients. Number one, uh, the ability to tell an unusual, convincing story while employing stock Western situations. Number two, the understanding of the nuances of character, of what motivates people. Number three, his ability to vividly depict the Western setting. Number four, the ability to build and maintain suspense. And number five, his prose is strong, always terse, smoothly constructed, and evocative. The things I notice about Frazee's writing, just from like, uh, you know, a sky level, is that the books normally involve mines or heavy machinery, Strong female characters like his uh, contemporary and Philip Ketchum, and dense Colorado wilderness. Uh, you can read a ton of Steve Frazee's short stories and novels on archive.org completely free. In terms of his short stories, man, it's hard to find a Western short story collection from the 20th century that doesn't feature a Frazee story. Some of the collections are The Real West, classic stories that inspired classic films. The Best of the West, Lawman, Best of the West 1 and 2, uh, Mammoth Book of Westerns, and A Treasury of World War II Stories. There's at least two uh, Steve Frazee-specific short story collections. One is edited by Bill Pronzini and Martin Greenberg called The Best Western Stories of Steve Frazee. The other is called Voices in the Hill, which is edited by Frazee's brother Eric. Both of those books were used as references for this feature. I also used IMDb. The Fiction Mag's online index, archive.org, and, of course, trusty Wikipedia. Tom, why don't you do a review for this episode, since I've been doing a lot of talking? Sure. My review today is a book called Killer by Robert Silverberg. Now, before he was science fiction royalty, Robert Silverberg was cranking out cheap genre paperbacks to make ends meet. His output included sleaze novels like a 1965 book called Passion Killer, 
originally released under the pseudonym of Don Elliott when the author was 29 years old. Now, after discovering that the book is actually a tidy bit of crime noir fiction, Starkhouse Press's imprint, Black Gat Books, re-released the paperback under the name Killer. So you collectors of sleaze novels may have this one already just sitting there dusting up your shelf under the name Passion Killer by Don Elliott. But if you want to read this book new, it uh, Starkhouse has a nice cover on it, or rather Black Gat Books has a nice cover on it under the name Killer, but and under the, his real name, Robert Silverberg. It's about a guy named Lee Floyd, who just arrived in Manhattan after being hired to kill a client's wife. You see, the client has recently met a girl named Marie and decided to upgrade. As such, he needs a hitman, this guy Lee, to dispose of his pesky wife and get rid of her so he can be with the beautiful Marie. For her part, this new girlfriend Marie is happy to allow a wealthy sucker like the client cover her living expenses, but she finds the client rather repugnant. Uh, Nevertheless, having one client pay for her bills is easier than working full-time as a call girl. All things being equal, Marie enjoys lesbian sex, and Silverberg pulls no 1965 (laughs) punches in his erotic writing of her lesbian encounters. This is definitely a sex book, and uh, those graphic scenes uh, comprise about half the novel. You can decide if that's good news or bad news for you. Uh, I'm a fan. I'm not going to lie to you. I make no apologies for liking a good sex scene in a book. But there are some interesting crime noir manipulations and double crosses among the sex scenes that make Killer a lot of fun to read. It is not top-tier hitman fiction that we would read from Max Allen Collins or Lawrence Block, but it is light years better than most of the 1960s sleaze fiction that I've dipped my toe into. Many authors are not proud of their output in this genre, but I'm glad Silverberg's kind of made peace with his past because Killer is definitely a winner. It's not a masterpiece, but it's definitely worth your time. Again, the book is called Killer by Robert Silverberg out on Black Gat, and if you have a sleaze collection, check out Passion Killer by Don Elliott. That's what I got. All right, so I'm going to do a complete change of pace. I'm going to do a um, review for a contemporary novel called Cradle Lake. It was authored by Ronald Malfi, published in 2013, and I I think it's available in a number of formats the last time I checked. This is an author we've talked about on the show, and I think you reviewed one of his recent novels, uh, Tom, Come With Me, I think was the name of it. Yeah, he's good. He's really scary. I reviewed two or three of his novellas on the blog also. Uh, Cradle Lake receives mostly positive reviews, but many claim that it's too much like Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. I can't necessarily disagree with that, but I still enjoyed the book. Uh, Like most horror movies and books, this one concerns a young couple experiencing a tragedy and then moving to the countryside. It's almost the baseline, it seems like, for every single horror concept. A lot of the books that a lot of the movies I watch. uh, Hey, we're Grandpa died. We're going to move into his house and start a new life for ourselves. And I'm like, don't do it. Right, exactly. (laughs) It's it's just always. Uh, So Alan and his wife Heather have experienced two miscarriages. Heather has attempted suicide twice, and she's deeply depressed. So a move from busy Manhattan to a quiet place in California seems like a really good idea. Behind the couple's house is a large lake, and it comes with a warning from the neighbor, a guy named Hank. He explains that the lake is magical and has healing powers. Alan sees the lake's capabilities when a guy from town has a car accident, and they take him to the lake instead of to the hospital. So it's really weird. So the town is a bit protective of spilling their secrets to the rest of the world about the lake. So Alan's idea, as you can probably imagine, is to dip his wife into the lake so she can be healed from things like depression, regret, low confidence, and and so forth. But there's a catch to the lake's power. There always is. (laughs) So uh, evident by the words Devil's Stone that he finds in the home of the last guy to live at the lake, a guy that killed his wife and himself uh, with a shotgun due to the lake's evil spell. Even though there isn't monsters, per se, in the book, It kind of reminded me of Michael Lamo's uh, really good horror novel, Deep in the Darkness. It also has the small-town horror-slash-secret feel that can be traced back to something like Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. Malfi is such a great writer that the occasional borrowed idea or premise doesn't really bother me that much. Mostly, the author is really, really original and innovative. Um, But again, this one's called Cradle Lake by Ronald Malfi, spelled M-A-L-F-I. You have to be careful when you're searching for his titles because sometimes they're listed as Ron instead of Ronald. Um, so you just it's kind of hit or miss with uh, looking for his books on like things like Amazon. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Malfi's brand new novel is out now. It's called Black Mouth. 
And uh, I'm excited to read it. In fact, just a few days ago, I purchased Black Mouth with my monthly Audible credit. It sounds really weird saying that. Right. If you're like an old school fan of Stephen King and maybe you don't read his novels anymore because you think he sucks or you don't like him personally or whatever, and you're looking for that author who's going to really sort of fill that void in your life, I think Ronald Malfi is an excellent choice. He is the modern Stephen King, much more so than Stephen King's own sons are who are writing very similar books. Yeah, I would agree. And you know, that terminology gets thrown around a lot, that comparison. He's um, the new Stephen King. Right. Everyone says that this is the this is the real one though. <laughs> yeah, trust trust us. Uh, we're saying that he really is the is that guy. Right. Let me do a couple plugs, uh, mostly for myself. There's a uh, a YouTube show, an actual video show that I've been on two episodes of, and I know we have a lot of authors and aspiring authors there. The book is called Experts. I'm sorry, the show is called Experts for Authors. It's done by a woman who's an author herself by the name of K.M. Robinson. So if you look up K.M. Robinson or Experts for Authors on YouTube, she did a two different 45-minute interviews for me. The idea of her show is she interviews kind of subject matter experts about what, they, what authors get right and what they get wrong in their books. And so I was interviewed for a 45-minute episode on FBI special agents and the FBI and, and kind of what authors should be careful of if they have any interest in being authentic. And I just did an another episode on private investigators and in uh, on what real life private investigation is like from an author's perspective so if they want to get that right so you can check out those two shows on youtube if you type in experts for authors or km robinson you're bound to find it how'd you get hooked up with that gig uh, she hit me up. I'm, oh. a, I'm a, a social media superstar now, as oh, you good. know. And I guess that's the other thing I should probably plug. I've done probably at this point maybe 100 different one-minute videos on all my social media, which are intended to be kind of on the slide, down low advertisements for my private investigator firm, but they're really just sort of interesting one minute videos. I hope they're interesting about different fraud and crime matters, including crimes that I've investigated and uh, best practices for investigators in the white collar and violent crime and national security arenas. So if you're interested in that, the uh, my name's Tom Simon, but you can also find me on Simon Investigations on pretty much every you know, on whether it's Twitter. TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, I'm, I'm on everything. So if you're interested in that or you're interested in hearing more of my voice, that's fine. But I don't talk about books, so it's probably way off topic for this. Anything else before we wrap up? That is it. All right, well, that wraps us up uh, when, with another episode. We're going to put that one in the books, as we say. Remember to follow us on all those social media platforms. Like us, tell your friends and neighbors about us, and just keep coming back for more reviews and podcast episodes. I'm going away for a couple months, but if Eric decides to do episodes, I will record some content for him. And behalf of, on behalf of Eric, bye for now. Be cool. <laughs>